Next up, we have a keynote speech on naval agility from the Chief of Naval Research of the Office of Naval Research, Rear Admiral Lauren C. Selby. Let's kick it over to the Admiral. Sir? Uh, hey, Brian. Thank you very much. Hey, it is great to be with everybody today. I wish I could be actually down in Austin at the Capitol Factory. I've uh, been down there before. It's been a few years, but uh, I will hopefully get back again maybe sometime uh, early next year. Um, okay, so I am the Chief of Naval Research. Uh, in that role, I run uh, the Naval Research Enterprise. What does that mean? That, that's uh, the Office of Naval Research, uh, which is where I'm sitting right now, headquarters here in Arlington, Virginia. That's the Naval Research Laboratory, which is across the river in Anacostia, uh, D.C., and uh, ONR Global, which has a uh, presence at various consulates and embassies around the globe, and then also uh, another organization, PMR 51, which does specialized work for, uh, for me and for the Navy Marine Corps team. Uh, that enterprise is really responsible for the early science and technology uh, money for the Navy. That's early R&D money. That's everything from the grants we provide to colleges and universities uh, to do basic research. So studying a phenomenology in a laboratory, some scientific principle, um, everything from physics to AI, quantum, biotech, all kinds of different areas we're, we're looking at. Uh, those, um, again, are grants that are done in university laboratories. Eventually, they get to a point where we look at them and either say, hey, there's something navally relevant there, or there's not. And if there's not, we probably at that point uh, either end the, end the work or put a bow on it, or we give it to somebody where, who maybe it is relevant to. Maybe it's relevant to NIH or they. NSF or any Army or, or Air Force. Uh, for those things that have naval relevance, so Naval, Navy, and Marine Corps, they have relevance for, for one of those equities, we might decide to continue funding uh, with, with different types of funding to now take the the technology, you know, the phenomenology and develop into an actual technology, uh, which could actually have some uh, application for a sailor or a Marine somewhere in the world. Um, that work is done at laboratories, at, uh, at contract sites, at warfare centers around the country. Uh, and eventually we get to a point where we bring the TRL level up to about five or six. And at that point, we're looking to transition it to someone who can put it in their system on their ship in the backpack of a Marine, wherever it might go. And so that now is a partnership we have to make with someone else to, to make that deal, to pull that technology into that application. That is the ubiquitous valley of death that people talk about. I, I jokingly call it the mode of despair, uh, but to, but that is the valley. That's where that, that, that happens. And that's an area where I'm spending some, you know, some resource on. And actually, Naval X, you just talked to Captain Van Buskirk, they're a key enabler in actually helping to tie both ends of that of that valley and try to figure out ways to flow tech across that uh, in a more seamless way. And so anyway, that's that's kind of what I do uh, in total. Um, what's my view on kind of where we sit today? So I, I truly believe we're kind of at a, uh, at a tipping point. I think that all of you like very much like me, um, kind of sense that uh, technology is is racing at a breakneck pace, uh, you know, towards us. Um, our our daily lives have become highly complex. Uh, we have uh, more things in our inboxes and in, in our to do list than we really have hours in the day to to do. Um, so we have to make choices. We have to make uh, uh, make decisions on what we're going to focus on, what we're not. Uh, I don't know about you. I, and maybe it's because I'm a control freak, but I like to kind of have control of a lot of like everything. Uh, that's really not possible. Uh, maybe it never was, but it's certainly not possible today because, again, the the complexity in the world that we live has gotten to the point where uh, no one individual or even one entity, one organization or even one country can really at this point solve all of these problems and really have a handle on all these things. So what does that mean? Um, I think this is probably uh, a repeating pattern in history. And even back to our early roots, you know, a couple hundred thousand years ago, I think we probably got to points where we got, you know, mentally full. We got to a point where we were kind of tapped out at the end of the day, at the end of the week. Uh, and then along came a technology that actually unburdened us and allowed us to actually progress to the next level of development. Um, the most um, probably pertinent example to kind of this group is probably the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. I've talked about this in many other discussions I give, but that was kind of when we perfected a machine to do the work of not just one human, but many humans. Okay. And that, that was the steam engine. Uh, clearly, we did things prior to that. We figured out how to, you know, take a mule and it helped 
have it plow your field by towing a, a you know a plow behind it. Uh, that was that was good. That was impressive. But until you actually were able to take a machine that you can now scale up and produce, uh, you know, the output of hundreds of human beings, uh, that really was where you got a tremendous impact. And that gave us back a very critical uh, part of our day. And that was just the white space to think, to ponder, and really uh, to do what, what humans do, which is to solve bigger and better problems. So that is uh, what technology has done in the past. And again, there are many, you can go throughout history. I mean, there's many examples you can think about when we figured out the wheel, when we figured out uh, the Gutenberg press, when we figured out obviously the steam engine, uh, we learned to fly. I mean, all these different things solve some other unique problem that we had. I think this is kind of Maybe just because I'm living in it, but I do think this one is maybe a little different because, again, the pace of change has gotten so rapid that we're really kind of on this, I think, kind of precipice of what side are we going to we're going to end up on? OK, there's the one side where it, it results in kind of chaos. There's the other side where we kind of tap into the good technologies to help us once again, alleviate some of the burdens on our mind, give us more free white space to think and ponder and go to the next level. That's where I like to think we're going to go. Um, and again, uh, I think historically that's where we have tended to gone. There's always been kind of a, a step the other way where the technology has driven us to a more nefarious place that that happens. But, but over time, the, the, the betterment of humanity is always kind of won out and allowed us to kind of continue that technological progress uh, in an upward, upward trend. Uh, that's where I think we'll go. Again, I do think there's maybe some rocky roads ahead. And whether it's things like artificial intelligence that helps unburden our minds from some of the just the complicated, uh, more automated functions of our life that a machine actually can do better than us, but would still give us back some space to do other things. Uh, I think all those things are happening all around us. As a as a member of the of the DoD and the U.S. Navy, uh, I guess what I would tell you is I think I see that happening more effectively in my personal life. When I think about my my iPhone or you know, my kids' Android devices, uh, it, it is happening there very rapidly, fairly seamlessly. I don't even really think anymore about the updates. They just happen at night, and I don't think about it uh, unless it's a critical one in which they push at you and say, update this now, now, now. Uh, otherwise, it just happens. And, and I think that is uh, where we want to be in our work lives. And it's not just DOD. I think other parts of industry, um, while some are doing far better than others, I think there's parts of industry that also struggle. And I do think that uh, that is indicative of what I would like to talk about first here, which is uh, organizations that do execution well, whether that's making automobiles, making donuts, uh, or even making warships. Uh, you get tuned to doing that execution function very well. Uh, and, and while it may not start out, it may start out rocky, over time, and when you have, in the case of um, our shipbuilding industry, for instance, when you have decades to to kind of get after that, you tend to get pretty good. Now, are, are there issues, problems along the way? Yep, absolutely. Could it be better? Yep, could always get better. But for the most part, when you get into an execution mindset of making something, uh, I think what happens is uh, you you specialize, you become somewhat stovepiped, and you become really good at execution. What happens though is that because you tend to be kind of head down on the problem all the time you're not head up looking around at what others are doing whether it's other companies other nations other competitors and as a result of that uh, you tend to get locked into solving your today problems there's a problem on my production line there's a problem with welding there's a problem with supply chain i've got to solve for my execution machine and as a result of that you if you're not careful will quickly find yourself to be on the losing end of the uh, of the cost curve or the warfare curve, whatever curve you're on, you're gonna be on the wrong side of that. And, and so you have to have an entity that can always be thinking about disruptive thoughts, about innovation, about taking tech and putting it into some existing things or maybe even some new things. Uh, and that's what an organization like O&R does. Um, the problem you have is depending upon kind of where that organization sits, it may or may not have a, a good pathway to flow those texts into your corporation. If you look at, uh, at the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, I mean, you're going to see that um, historically, until about 30 years ago, the companies that got on that, you know, the top 10 list of those companies had been there for 50 or more years. 
maybe 100 years in the case of some companies. Uh, today, what you're going to find is that just in the last 30 years alone, that has totally changed, where now you will see that there are new companies added to that list, if not every year, at least every couple of years. And the list that you have today looks far different than the list we had even 10 years ago and even 10 years prior to that. And that is because, again, the technology is racing ahead quickly. There's a lot of disruptive thoughts and technologies being injected into the system. And that is resulting in tremendous change. And that change is what's driving a lot of that kind of uncomfortable feeling that I think a lot of us have, kind of looking around, feeling all these changes coming, wondering kind of where it's all, all going to end up. Um, and so to get after that, you have to have this organization that kind of sits outside the lifelines. It's looking at these technologies and thinking through where are the tech, where's the tech going? Where are we going? And how do we marry the two together to actually take advantage of those technologies in a way that will allow this organization, whatever the organization is, to remain relevant? And that, again, is something that, that we are uh, we endeavor to do at this organization. Uh, ONR has been around since 1946. So this actually is our 75th uh, anniversary year. It's our 75th birthday, as it were. And we've been having all kinds of celebrations throughout the year, unfortunately, mostly virtual because of COVID. Uh, but, uh, but 75 years ago, on August 1st, 1946, uh, President Truman signed in the law, Public Law 588, which established the Office of Naval Research. That came out of an idea that was developed in World War II by Vannevar Bush. And Vannevar Bush uh, had been a dean at MIT uh, when the war got started, left that job, came to DC and worked directly for President Roosevelt uh, in the uh, Office of Scientific Research and Development. And that OSRD organization uh, was this kind of disruptive, outside the box uh, organization that was looking to figure out how to take new technologies and get them to the warfighters rapidly. And uh, again, it was, linked directly to senior leadership. Uh, it had uh, its own budget. It had autonomy to do crazy things. It, it failed a lot, but it succeeded enough uh, that it was able to turn the tide on, on World War II. Uh, that is kind of the model from which ONR was established in 1946. And then along came, a few years later, came the National Science Foundation and, and others. Uh, but ONR was really the lead uh, government organization that came out of World War II to establish an S&T entity to, to develop that technology and always try to stay ahead uh, so we can make sure our sail, sailors and soldier, soldiers, Marines, Airmen are never in a fair fight. Okay, so that's that's kind of critically important to, uh, to our function. And that remains relevant today. I, I do think it's a little different today. Um, so when I came in last year, I asked guys, wait, what's our function? And everybody said, wait, we're about the future of naval power. And I do think that's what we're about, but I, I like to reframe it. And so I talk about reimagining naval power, and I think there's a distinct difference because I think today we have a unique opportunity uh, because uh, technology is where you know the state of technology has gotten to the point where it is today that I think we can actually rewrite the rules on the future of, again, everything from business to warfare by ad adopting the right technologies in the right way, marrying them with uh, the right humans and operators uh, to achieve, I think, incredibly decisive advantage if we if we do this right and again every company out there uh, is also trying to do similar things and that's how companies stay relevant uh, they take the, whatever new tech is coming along the pike and they figure out ways to adapt that to their business model and provide provide something of service to uh you know to the to the consumer it's really no different for us we're trying to provide things of value to the warfighters so they can maintain an advantage uh, whether it's a deterrent advantage or a decisive offensive advantage if, if required against an adversary and that that's uh that's a lot of what we do um let's go let's go ahead and go to the first slides here just riffing away here this is just a little bit of our history and so um you know again look back at the bottom left there starts with naval research lab so nrl actually has been around almost 100 years here here in uh, 2023 we'll be celebrating its 100th anniversary its 100th birthday uh where right now she's you know 98 years old but nrl again is a part of my enterprise but it actually precedes even even the office of naval research itself uh that, that is the navy's corporate laboratory and again, it's here in D.C. Uh, in Anacostia and uh, sits right across the river from, from where I am right here. But you can kind of just go through this list and look at the different things. I mean, from radar to advancements with nuclear submarines. Uh, you, Alvin. Alvin is a mini submarine that, uh, believe it or not, is still in operation today. But you can see back here, Alvin in service 1964. Uh, that mini submarine has done all kinds of amazing research on the seabed. In fact, 
we have upgraded the uh, the sphere, uh, which is where the humans sit. Uh, it has a new sphere, and that sphere is rated to go to uh, 4,500 meters. Uh, and so uh, we are actually in a process of upgrading that to go to 6,500 meters right now. And that will allow us to reach pretty much 98% of the world's uh, the deepest depths of the oceans, not the Marianas Trench deep, but again, 90, about 98% of the, the world's oceans bottoms will be reachable wet by Alvin. Uh, so that that capability, we did a lot of work with GPS, gallium nitride. I mean, if you have a if you have an LED TV uh, or you know any kind of a high tech electronics, you have gallium nitride is part of what you what you have. That was something that the this research enterprise was a part of developing back in the 60s. Lasers, we did a lot of work with uh, what was called the Maser, and that became the laser. Uh, we have lasers on ships today. And uh, that work was started by uh, by grants that we gave uh, to a gentleman named Charles Towns at Columbia University back in the, I think in the 50s, actually, for that one. And, uh, and you can see that, obviously, it took many years to get that to a point where we put on a ship. Uh, some of that was technology driven, but a lot of that was just kind of desire driven. And, and uh, sometimes those don't always match up. What, what is the needs of the fleet versus what is the technological capability? They don't always marry up. And uh, this, this is a case where it took a little longer, uh, but we now have lasers that are actually going on ships. So you could see a tremendous amount. You can see, I think, ONR uh, funded the, the technology that finds Titanic. Uh, Robert Ballard, uh, Captain Robert, retired Robert Ballard, is one of our, our, our primary principal researchers. He's been with us a long time. In fact, uh, he was on a webcast I did uh, a month or so ago to celebrate our 75th anniversary. So you could see this. I'm not going to go through the whole list here, but a lot of stuff is on here. Let's go to the most recent stuff on here, though. You can see that Naval X established in 2019. Uh, that was obviously Captain Van Buskirk, who just preceded me in his discussion. Uh, but also you can see there, we've got these tech bridges now that uh, that Nalex is, is shepherding across the, across the globe now with London and all over the United States. And then uh, doing a lot of work with STEM. So I'm also the Naval STEM executive. And I do believe that um, that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and I'm not I'm not against arts, so steam. I got it. I'm not against it, but I'm just actually I'm focused on the, the technology, engineering, and math piece uh, because of kind of what I do here. Um, that is, I think, a tremendous area of concern. We we just don't develop enough and produce enough STEM talent that are, you know that are U.S. citizens that can actually get clearances to work for you know places like ONR. Um, that's something that's that's we're we're really trying to take a turn on that, trying to reinvigorate the whole STEM system, trying to. It, utilize uh, virtual means as well as in-person means uh, to conduct internships and co-ops to get kids interested in STEM, but also more importantly, to keep them interested and that provide them mentorship uh, to pull them when they may, maybe have a down, uh, you know, down semester and then they get discouraged, try to keep them focused on it. Not trying to ki make kids that aren't STEM kids, STEM kids, but for those that are STEM kids, we lose far too many because either they get discouraged along the way, they don't see opportunity, or in a lot of cases, they don't see people that look like them in more senior positions. And so we're trying to really turn the tide on that because I do think that's an incredibly important area of focus that we have to have to get after. You also see on here something that says, says IBP21 at the very top right of this graphic. So that's the Integrated Battle Problem 21. So back in April of this year, uh, we ran an exercise in the Southern California Operators off San Diego. where We brought in about 29, 30 autonomous systems to work uh, independently as well as uh, in harmony with some some manned platforms, ships, submarines, uh, and aircraft to show what these systems could do uh, in an operationally relevant environment, uh, looking for other ships, looking for other contacts, providing targeting data. Uh, it was an eye-watering exercise. We learned a great deal. A lot of that's going into some of the research we're doing in other areas to just continue to refine those, uh, those capabilities. Um, if you look at the future of warfare, I do think that by mid-century, you're going to see a, a much larger percentage of our force that is autonomous. Um, you're still going to have a lot of manned platforms, but I, I contend that you're going to have a lot of autonomous, and eventually you'll have more autonomous than not. And uh, they will be working some independently, uh, some in concert with, uh, again, a, a manned platform. But I think that shift is is actually underway now. We're at the very beginning of that wave. That will continue uh, for the foreseeable future. So there's a whole host of issues with that, from everything from autonomy, uh, rules of the road, uh, you know, algorithms to make sure that the 
the vessel can operate safely on the high seas with other platforms uh, to some of the, the systems and sensors that are on those platforms. Um, taking some advice for, from some uh, Silicon Valley folks uh, several months back, you know, they told me when, whatever we do with autonomous systems, let's make sure it's more about the software than the hardware. And I think that's definitely right. Uh, it should be less about how exquisite the platform is, the, the autonomous platform is, and it should be more about how exquisite the analytics are on the back end that are looking at the data to go find the signal and the noise, you know, whatever, whatever it is you're looking for. I mean, you, you want to get after it with, with the software and, uh, and aggregate whatever the central data is, bring it back to a central location and really apply the analytics to it. And so that's something we're trying to do uh, with some initiatives we got underway. So a lot of great, a lot of great work that we're doing uh, across a whole host of spectrums. Let's go, let's go to the next slide. So uh, this is a slide that um, I a little bit love to talk about. This is the Canafin, it's called, it's pronounced Canafin, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N, Canafin Framework. Uh, a gentleman named David Snowden, who was an IBM researcher, uh, put this out you know, probably maybe 20 years ago. Um, if you Google Canafin Framework Snowden, a, a, like a short 10 minute video will come up where he kind of explains explains this. But but I contend that that we live mostly in the top left quadrant, which is complex. We wish we lived in the top right or or bottom right con, uh, quadrants, but we really really don't. Uh, maybe episodically we're in one of those for certain aspects of our job or our lives but for the most part we're kind of in the top left problem you have is if you're not sure which block you're in uh, the actions you take can actually be detrimental so let's take the top right for example in the complicated world so and actually let me let me read you something so there's a book that i just just finished reading called range okay this is this is it was a great read david epstein and one of the things that he says in here and I, he doesn't talk about canafin but as i read this I'm like this is canafin and so one of the things he talks about in here, um, and this is what I think he means by, I think this is the complicated world. Patterns repeat over and over and feedback is extremely accurate and usually very rapid. Okay. So in the complicated world, you have, um, have a problem that occurs. You sense the problem with whatever sense you've got. Maybe it's temperature is going up or maybe you sense water on the deck. Um, you analyze the problem. And when you, after you analyze it, you've kind of categorized it in your brain and you now say, okay, I, I need to respond because water on the floor is flooding. I need to respond to flooding by shutting valves, uh, turning on the pumps to get rid of the water. Uh, the temperature is rising uncontrollably. I need to turn off the system or maybe it's a fire. I got to put the fire. So you sense, you then analyze the situation and then you respond based upon kind of good practices, you know, expertise that you've gained over, over a career, over, over your job experience. That's one world. Okay. The other world is complex. Okay. And you can see cause and effect are only coherently in retrospect and do not repeat. And so one thing they say in the book range, which I think is a good a description of this, um, David uh, Epstein calls, calls complex world. He calls them wicked domains or wicked problems. And in this wicked problem, the rules of the game are often unclear or incomplete. There may or may not be repetitive patterns and they may not be obvious. And feedback is often delayed, inaccurate, or both. Um, so, <laughs> so in most devilishly wicked learning environments, experience will reinforce the exact wrong lessons. <laughs> so that's actually, a, I think, a pretty, <laughs> I think that's pretty apropos to our current situation that we find ourselves in. Um, deep expertise in any one area, you know, wh whether it's, you know, some engineering field or some scientific field or even some, you know, liberal arts field, deep expertise in one field, while good for doing that thing, whatever that expertise thing is, nuclear engineering, for nuclear engineering, when you get into complex worlds, what you find is you're now bridging many different domains of problems. It's cross-disciplinary. And as a result of that, if you utilize your expertise from your single domain exclusively, you can find yourself very quickly actually making the other parts of the problem worse. And you can then fool yourself into thinking maybe part of the problem is getting better when in fact the entire problem set is getting worse. So what uh, this book is actually getting after is that um, people that actually have broader experience, so T-shaped people instead of I-shaped people, broader experience actually are better tuned to, to living in a complex world. Uh, because again, you have enough insights in different areas, but not too deep that you're now able to kind of cross 
uh, crosswalk these different issues and really kind of get after areas that you can actually apply pressure to actually make the situation better and not worse. So it's very interesting read, very interesting idea. And that gets after some of my thinking about how artificial intelligence might be able to help us with some of these wicked problems in the future. And part of my thinking is that you have to, you have to dissect the problem and you have to allow the machine to go after what I would call the complicated parts, the parts that are very repeatable, are very formula driven, things that machines do really well. Let the machine do that to kind of allow more brain capacity to focus on the wicked part of the problem, where really the human is better suited to solve those problems, at least in today's you know computing environment. Maybe some that will change, but I don't think yet. And better yet, when you team the two together, when you bring both of these together, the machine and the human brain together, you get you get even better, uh, better performance. And that's that's been proven in a bunch of you know gaming situations, uh, but but I think that's also would apply to business, would apply to warfare as well. And then the bottom left is chaos. Chaos is like 9/11, right? It's a black swan event. You couldn't predict it, predict it, but in this kind of world, you have to act decisively. Then you sense, then you respond. So think about 9/11. You, you get uh, the first plane goes into the tower. Second plane goes in. Quickly realizes this is this is not. Uh, an accident. This is a deliberate act. So you take decisive action, land every plane in North American airspace now. So act right now, act, do it decisively. And then you sense, are there any other attacks? Are there any other uh, planes that are, that are flying around? I mean, I'm not talking about the, the Pentagon or the, or Pennsylvania that are already happening. Uh, you sense, okay, nothing else is happening. You respond slowly restore the bridges in and out of New York City, in and out of DC, and over the course of days, restore airplanes and airspace. That's chaos, okay? And that's the black swan events. And unfortunately we have those, you know, at a higher frequency than we have in the past, uh, I think. I mean, it's, that's also the world we live in. But again, the point of this is you have to kind of know where you are in this, in this domain, uh, or else you can act in a way that actually makes the problem set worse. Okay, I think that's the last slide there. Okay, go back to the first, just go back to the 75th anniversary slide for, there you go, right, one more, right there, right there. Okay, um, I think, looking at my watch here, I think what I'd like to do now is actually, I'd like to entertain your questions. I mean, I've given you a lot there, but I'd really like to hear what's on your mind, and uh, and let's go from there. All right, here we go. Are you using Agile and Scrum methodology for acquisition of these new primes? In some areas, we are. I wouldn't say it's like baked in everything we do. It's not, but in some areas, we are. In fact, um, I had a great conversation with um, with my Royal Navy friends, uh, and they are actually training Scrum, uh, you know, kind of wholesale across their force. So I'm going to actually get my Naval X team actually to take some of these courses to see see what uh, see what they think, see what we can do with it. So are we using it everywhere? No. Are we using it in some areas? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's certain parts of the ecosystem where this is actually being used. So, uh, but yeah, thanks for the question. Canafin, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N, -E um, is the Canafin model. I don't know. I don't know what that means, but it's called the Canafin framework. Um, and it's, again, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N framework. If you just Google that, uh, David Snowden, you can watch the video. But but uh, it's, it's a framework. I don't know if it's a model. It's really more of a framework. Next. I know you got questions out there. There you go. AI battle problem. Um, well, in fact, um, so AI is is obviously an area where a lot of folks are looking at, and there's a lot of probably overhype with AI, uh, as, as with a lot of new technologies that come along. Uh, but we are actually looking at ways to utilize some aspects of AI. Um, you know, AI is not like doesn't just doesn't like do everything. It's usually very case specific. Uh, you know, it, you got to focus on the right problem. Not every problem is is an AI kind of problem. But we are in fact looking at how to utilize some algorithms to go after some um, some problem sets. And so uh, there are there's a continuing series of experiments in the unmanned arena that are going to happen over the course of the next year. Some will have some uh, more focus on AI than others. Um, the, the thing I been talking about. We're trying to bring in a number of um, attributable autonomous systems with sensors uh, and bring the data back to a, a facility where I can then apply analytics to it. Some of that will, of course, be some, some AI analytics, not all, but some, some aspects of it will be utilizing AI to go after 
maybe trying to find certain targets or certain characteristics or find something that's not like the other things in the, in the picture, as it were. Will Naval X also, also work with SpaceWorks as the Navy is also a major part? Yeah, so, well, SpaceWorks, AFWorks, um, yeah. So Naval X already does, and they have routine interactions, phone calls, Zoom calls uh, with, with their other counterparts. I don't know about SpaceWorks per se. AFWorks, definitely. I'm not even sure how mature SpaceWorks is at this point. Um, it, U.S. Navy is a major partner in space. Uh, and just so you know, um, my Naval Research Laboratory does a tremendous amount of work for the Air Force, uh, for NOAA, for NASA, and for now Space Force. And so we are actually a, uh, a big part of the uh, R&D S&T ecosystem that supports space. And we have, in fact, we've been doing that from the very beginning. Uh, Naval Research Laboratory was there at the very start. So yes, that will continue. And again, I don't know specifically what the state of play as SpaceWorks is. I don't even know if it's formally been stood up yet, but we do already have relations with AFWorks and that will continue. And I, I assure you that if SpaceWorks joins that, joins the band here, we'll be all together on similar calls in the future. Because again, like a lot of things, this is a very, um, there's a lot of issues, a lot of areas that cross services, cross different technologies, cross different services. And a lot of what we end up doing is trying to connect the dots between different entities. Uh, it's it's that team of teams concept that you know, General McChrystal talks about in his books. How do we establish that team of teams? Some of it is via formal relationships, formal networks, but a lot of that is actually informal networks where you actually are establish relationships and you think to call, you know, Joan, when you've got an issue that's a space related one, because you know Joan works at SpaceWorks, so you call her what you got because it may be something that may be interesting to her or someone else. So, anyway, that's that's very important that we do that. So, the answer to this will be yes. I guess I can also read over here the questions over here, see if I can see them. Right, here we go. How does ONR plan to address the growing threat of, of uh, UASs in the battle space? What is the preferred counter US? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a whole host of methods, and I'm not going to talk specifics, but I mean, some you can think about. I mean, you can actually go up and physically touch them with something, uh, whether it's a projectile related or it's something that goes up and flies up and touches it, maybe it puts a net on it. And there's other ways you can use other parts of the spectrum to uh, to engage these things. So, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're looking at this, and there's many uh, systems that we're testing in the laboratory as well as in the field. So uh, that will be continue to be something we look at. I, th I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, these things are not going away uh, between commercial uses, uh, whether it's looking for forest fires or uh, following pipelines or, uh, or some other application that, that a military might use. They are, they are here to stay. And, uh, uh, and I think that it, it's in our best interest to think about what does the world look like with these proliferating everywhere. How do you use them to your advantage and what do you have to do differently to uh, to counter them or to uh, avoid being, you know, within their uh, their range of observ observation, whatever their sensor might be. So yeah, there it, it's definitely something we look at continuously. It's it's a it's a growth industry. No, you beat me to it. Oh back to Kane friend. Yeah, so I think the best practice in the moment, I mean, if you look at each of those blocks, go back to that, go back to the camping slide, please. If you can put the slides back up. If you go back to the blocks, uh, they all have sense somewhere in there. Some are at the beginning and some are kind of in the middle. And, and the reason, if you think about the complex world, the reason is second, because of the complexity of the situation, the cross-domain nature of the problem set, you have to actually perturbate the system. You have to summit, you have to push on the balloon and you got to see what it, you have, then have to sense what it does. And in doing that, uh, you actually get a, you get a representation of what the different issues might be. The first couple, the, the obvious one, I mean, this is like the little kid who sees someone put a block, you know, a block on a table and then someone puts two blocks next to it on the table and the kid immediately starts thinking and said, well, that's one, two, oh, it's three blocks. One plus two is three. I mean, you're sensing categorizing your head. Well, I know math one and two, that's three. And then you respond, uh, the complicated world you sense. And because it's a, it's a known domain, you know, that if it's water on my floor under the sink, 
I got a leak and I can either fix it myself or I call a plumber. We call the subject matter expert. So that's sense. Analyze, analyze, analyze says it's a leak. And they're responding by calling the plumber or fixing it myself. In the complex, you, again, you got to probe the system because uh, the nature of the problem is such that if you just start acting, you know, sensing and acting based upon your even your intuition, you might be off. But if you probe the system in some way, you somehow perturbate the system in some way, whether it's physically or, or by asking questions, or you actually can then uh, elicit responses that can then help you get, you know, get to the right uh, the right response. And then chaos. Uh, because it's so chaotic, you have to take decisive action or it just runs away from you. And again, this is why, uh, you know, for instance, as a submariner, we do a lot of training on things like flooding. Flooding is bad on a submarine. And so you train on this repeatedly. And so when flooding happens, there are immediate actions that you take just based upon they're ingrained in your in your head because you've done it so many times in practice. that when it happens, there's just absolutely no question. You know exactly what to do. And I mean, I could kind of repeat it all right now. I won't because some of it I probably don't want to share. But there are things you do immediately. Fire, the same thing. You have an immediate response. If you don't, it gets out of control. It runs away from you too quickly. And so that action is critical. That, that decisive action is critical. And a lot of times, that one, because you're not exactly sure, your action might actually not be the right action. But what it may end up doing is revealing what the right response now needs to be and then you take that action so anyway that's a lot but uh very fascinating subject next uh next question please uh okay so we actually have a digital engineering we call it a what we call it it's a community of practice things that we call it so we are actually trying to to work to um kind of bring together the ecosystem of folks across the Department of the Navy that are working on digital engineering. Uh, there's a lot of great work going on, and I'm finding that there's just pockets of excellence in a lot of places. What I have yet to find is really pulling the entire thread together. And so if anybody has heard me brief when I was the chief engineer, I used to talk a lot about uh, the digital thread. I had this kind of circular thing that everybody started calling the Selby swoosh. And it basically looks at the entire domain of, you know, when you come up with, when you're trying to design a new ship, so you have a concept formulation phase, and we have some great digital tools to do that. When you get into kind of contract level design or even detailed design, you've got some really high-end CAD CAM tools that you do that. Uh, and then when you get into, you know, building, you've got some great build tools that are that are based in the shippers that know how to link the, you know, the, the digital design to the lead that's going to make the part or to the, you know, the machine that's going to make the widget. That we have pretty well mapped. And then when you get to operations, uh, we're starting to actually develop digital twins for different components that we can actually use to monitor the operation of the real component and then look for divergence between the real component and the twin. And then that drives you to some kind of a maintenance action. So we're getting better at that. And that's, that's kind of a beginning phase that's actually starting to build up. What we don't do is we don't do a good job of bringing these all together. And so it's, it's often the case that you'll actually, in one part of those, those spheres of the design kind of build operate phase, you actually end up kind of redoing the model, redoing, rebuilding the model uh, instead of having a continuous thread. They, and I recognize this is, that's over simplicity. It's not all going to flow perfectly. It's not going to be one continuous thread, but we can do a far better job of linking the right parts of this together. And that's where we're trying to, we're trying to drive, uh, the broader DON to that kind of a, a concept. And NavalX is actually helping, helping kind of at least get that thinking going, get that discussion going across the ecosystem. Uh, what is the next offset strategy? Yeah, you know, this is like the question, you know, what, if there's one technology you could focus on, what would, you, would it be? It, look, there's, there's not one technology. It, you have to, you have to look across uh, many technologies or else you're going to find yourself betting on the wrong. It's like, it's like anybody knows Betamax and VHA. It's like picking Betamax, like, you know, pick Betamax. And next thing you know, the whole world changes to VHS. And of course that's changed freaking hundred times since then with, CDs, Blu-ray, Blu-ray are now on streaming on demand. So uh, you got to very carefully, uh, you, you don't want to single up all lines. So I don't, you know, what's the next offset strategy? You know, there's a, there's a bunch. Does it have to do with autonomous systems? Probably. Does it have to do with some form of AI? Probably. Does it have to do with some way of helping the human uh, characterize problems like the Canavan framework? Does it help me maybe get rid of some of the complicated stuff, takes that out of the picture, so I now free my brain to, to do the things the brain does well, which is kind of abstract thinking, knitting a whole bunch of different things together? Probably. Uh, is that one thing that I'm going to 
tell you is the, is the is my offset strategy for the future no i'm gonna i'm gonna be doubling down on a lot of these different areas because i think there's a there's a piece of all of those that are going to be important to to helping us solve these hard problems in the future so again uh, you know i don't want to i'm not going to get ahead of anybody in the in the dod or administration who are putting together their plans uh but I would tell you, you have to very, very carefully, but if we're singling up on all lines on any one thing, you want to make sure you're, you've got a very broad base and you're really covering down on a bunch of different bets. And again, that's what I do. I mean, a lot of, a lot of what I do, especially in the basic research areas, is, is I am actually looking at a host of technologies that, you know, when you see them face value, you may not see that there's a naval application because there may not be yet. We haven't actually developed it far enough yet, but I can guarantee you this, if I don't, work on it today and no one works on it today you'll have nothing tomorrow and so uh th that's why we that's why we try to spread the portfolio around uh, very carefully to be looking at all kinds of different issues this must be a long question typing in oh okay watch here wow you guys i know there's questions out there all right let me let me uh hold on a second here you guys keep thinking i'm looking for something else i want to share with you um all right so um <clears throat> So one of the other themes that comes out of this book range, and again, I'm only I'm harping on this one because I just finished it like two days ago. Um, one of the things it talks about is the decision between or the difference between decision making and sense making. OK, and so so and this is the, this is the author here. So if I make a decision, it's a possession. I take pride in it. I tend to defend it and not listen to those who question it. OK, that's key. Um, if I make sense then this is more dynamic and I listen and I can change it. So uh, there's a huge difference. To, it may be a kind of a nuance, but when you really think about that, you know, decision-making versus sense-making, sense-making is I think where we want to be. And, and I, I think that uh, utilizing algorithms, and again, some may be AI-based, some maybe not, to help the human eliminate the noise, the chaff, so you can really focus on the thing that you're trying to make sense of. I think there's something in that. There's a kernel in that. And I think that's something that, you know, I, I would ask this team to think through. How do we how do we get after that? Because I think that's it's more nuanced, but I think that's really important. We talk a lot about wanting AI to help us, you know, make key decisions in battle or in business. Okay, maybe. But I think it's I think that's too maybe that's too grandiose of a, of a thing to, to try to go after. I think we ought to focus this down on what are the things we can do to just help the human being make sense of the situation so you can then maybe at some point make that decision because you still ultimately have to make a decision that you you are going to own but along the way you don't want to make that too soon with so much noise that it's misguided and, and maybe it gets you in the wrong quadrant of the king infant framework for instance so i think that's key um uh one other thing here that, that i'll share with you so i'm doing a lot of thinking about kind of the way we're structured and the way um the way organizations that as I, as I talked to at the beginning, get in this execution mode. When you get into that mode, oftentimes you tend to bury good ideas within the, the belly of the beast, as it were. And, and, and that's because, again, you're so tuned to delivering your thing on schedule and cost, you know, at the performance spec that you've developed, that a lot of times those new ideas are threatening. They're, they're, they're considered disruptive, threatening in a way that it could actually throw you off schedule or throw you off cost or, or change things in a way that are going to make that producibility function if you're producing something that much harder. That's a problem we've got to figure out because I do find that a lot of times that value of death, uh, again, I, I jokingly call it the motor despair. I call it that because I think a lot of times uh, the PEOs that are trying to do those, those really hard builds of complex things are trying to keep those things on cost, schedule performance. New idea comes in. And they dig that moat faster 
<laughs> the more audacious the idea is it's coming in because it's threatening. It is threatening and disruptive. They build the moat, they fill it with water and throw alligators in at the boot. So that's something we got to figure out. And again, this is where I think Naval X is helping some in the area, building those relationships on both sides, trying to build more trust. We're not trying to disrupt you for the just sake of disrupting you. We're, we're trying to disrupt because we think this is something really impactful that can actually change change the world, change your slice of the world. Uh, so that's an area where we're trying to actually really look at that and, and make sure we're tuned appropriately. Uh, I think that's an area where we we need to need some tuning to, to kind of tighten that thing up. I think that's true across, I think it's true across industry. I mean, there's, there's very few points in industry that really have got this right and can, can repeatedly do this year after year after year. There's a lot of parts in the industry where they're not able to do this and they are quickly becoming irrelevant and in some cases going out of business. So that's an area where, where I put a little, uh, you know, mental thought. All right. What did that, I'm sure that spurred a couple. I saw somebody typing away over there on the right. So that spurred any additional questions. All right. Uh, is there an equal push in the Navy for hypersonics as exists at the Air Force? Yeah, I think, um, um, yeah. And actually we team with the Air Force. We're very closely teamed with the Air Force on this. And, um, so yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a, an equal push, and we're because because we work with the Air Force uh, and other parts of the DoD, we're working with them on some areas that we think are things they should just do, and we'll watch other parts that we're looking at uh, that because again there's a naval relevance to it. We're looking at uh, example I used recently on another discussion um, aircraft. So a lot of aircraft development is done by the Air Force. But there's also parts of an aircraft that have very unique naval, unique attributes. One is landing gear. When you land on an aircraft carrier and you have a hook and you have got to you know, slow that airplane down very rapidly, it puts a tremendous amount of stress on the entire airframe as far as, as well as the landing gear. That's something that's navally relevant. We look at that and we do that study because that's something they don't need to land in the desert or land on a runway uh, on land. So we, we do that work. Same thing with corrosion, seawater, sea spray uh, on the flight deck. That's different on, obviously, they don't have that in the desert. They've got sand. We've got, you know, we've got salt spray. So that's an area where we will uh, we will do things that are navally relevant. Same thing with hypersonics. So we, we look carefully at what Air Force and others are doing, uh, and we try to, you know, lever what they're doing for things that we need, and they, uh, they allow us to go off and do things that are navally relevant. So as iteration times on digital technology continue to shrink, how will this change the way owner balances research versus implementation? Yeah, that's an interesting one. And I had this conversation actually yesterday with, with uh, some of my folks. So you look at things like DevSecOps and the ability to push software, you know, you know maybe within, you know, <laughs> days would be nice, maybe minutes one day. But, you know, tra traditionally it's been for us has been, you know, like every year, maybe we push a software patch, maybe. We're trying to get to the point where that's more like your iPhone. It's like every night something gets pushed out. Um, and so that's clearly we need to get there. Okay. And that's not just us. That's really the entire DOD. That's all of the industry is trying to get to that same kind of a model. Um, the point that I had in this conversation yesterday was what ONR should be looking at is things that are kind of in the future coming to us, disruptive technologies that are coming and, and then maturing those. And then there's a point where we're like, okay, this is no longer an S and T thing. This is now really, just engineering. And so we hand it to a warfare center, we hand it to industry, we hand it to a PEO to put on a ship or platform or put it wherever it goes. Um, as you bring that timeline down to, you know, minutes for deploying software, there's a, is that really, are we looking far enough ahead? And so once you've kind of get that production engine rolling, that's pushing that software rapidly to where it's going, we need to be focused on, okay, what now, what's the, what is the algorithms we have to be looking at that are, that are not mature today that we can provide us some T dollars to, to go mature, they're gonna solve some really hard problem. And then once it's ready, whether it's tomorrow or three years from now, we then push it because we've got the, we've got the, uh, the production line ready to push that thing out to, to the ship. So anyway, that's, that's, that's one, uh, one thought on that, on that question. All right, wow. Think away, think away. Any questions? All right, no more questions. Well, it's been awesome being with all of you today and uh, hopefully uh, 
Uh, hopefully there's a nugget or two in there or something that interests you. And, uh, you know, if you have any thoughts out there, uh, you know, I'm always looking for outside thing. I do a lot of reading. I, I do a lot of discussions with folks all the time about kind of what they're thinking about the state of play of technology impacts on the world organizational structure. Uh, there's a whole host of, of things that, uh, that we're trying to solve here at ONR and uh, can't do it, can't do it all by ourselves. We have to do this as a team. No question about it. Well, thank you very much, Admiral. Um, looks like I got another book to add to my reading list. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's great. A, of note, uh, the Cenefin framework was created by David Snowden. You said that in 1999, when he was working with IBM at our global business services. So that, that brings it a little home. Oh, there now. you go. That's right. What am I yeah. saying? Of course, one of the hosts here. Yeah, yeah. Love the tie. That's so right. Bring the Navy piece and my IBM piece. I'm having a great yeah. time. Check, and check out that. There's a quick video. I mean, it's like eight, eight or nine minutes long. And it's a, it, it kind of, he just, he says what he's thinking as he put that thing together. So, yes, sir. I've already ordered the workbook too. <laughs> All right. Good. good. <laughs> and I also appreciate you illustrating to the non military uh, audience members that Naval means Navy and Marine Corps. So, that, that first joint force yeah. faces a lot of the same challenges at sea. So, any technologies they're thinking about, Navy could possibly also apply to the Marine Corps, too. So, think about that. And then finally, happy birthday to ONR. That that's great. I really, yeah, really thank appreciate you very it. much. Yeah, seventy five years, pretty amazing. Uh, and I just and whether we're just getting started, we're just getting started. But it's an amazing legacy, amazing history, and but a lot of a uh, lot of challenges ahead of us. A lot of problems, a lot of challenges, and uh, you know we're we're tuned to go help solve those.